not really have an equivalent in the Hebrew or the Greek in scripture. The way we get our term godly is a result of the term pious. And pious is a Latin term and it comes to us from the, the Latin Vulgate. <clears throat> when you have the term in the Old Testament that's uh, the word kasid, uh, it's an adverb in the Greek, which, or excuse me, an adjective in the Greek, which is probably the closest uh, term that we have in the Old Testament that would equi equate with our term gracious. Uh, its companion term, which is a noun, uh, is used significantly in the Psalms that describe God as being one who is lovingly kind. And so this, this term kasid that we're looking at that's translated godly in the Old Testament many times. The King James translates it only four times as godly, but the New American Standard translates it 27 times in the Old Testament as being the, uh, the word godly. <clears throat> we looked at the fact that the term godly is a conjunction with the, ter the word God, which is a title for deity. I think we all understand that. And the L-Y ending means light. And <clears throat> the first confusion of the term comes from the fact that our English does not define godly consistently. And I brought a, a, a couple of dictionaries a couple of weeks ago that showed that the, the L-Y ending is stated in English dictionary to be equivalent to, to mean like, and that uses godly is an illustration of that. So the English dictionary says godly means to be like God. But if you turn to the term godly, that, that's looking at the, def, uh, the definition of L-Y in the English. But if you turn to the, the word godly, that's used as an illustration in that very same dictionary, it doesn't say that it means to be God like God, it means to be loving God or devoted to God or to be pious. <clears throat> that's not the same thing. Piety in the Latin 1400 years ago, when or 1300 years ago, when the Latin Vulgate was first <clears throat> translated, <clears throat> loosely I would say perhaps, although sometimes quite accurately from the original uh, Hebrew and Greek, the term piety was equivalent to the term kindness. And that's what our word kasid in the Hebrew means. It means to be kind or to be a, a kindly, a gracious one. <clears throat> and so the term piety back when the Latin, gate, Latin Vulgate was written was equivalent with our Hebrew term kasid. But over the past 350 years, at some point in there, the term piety has changed definitions. It's been like three weeks ago, I think I brought a, a dictionary, an English, Latin, Greek dictionary that I have that was published in 1653 that shows that as late as 1653, the term piety meant kind, it was equivalent. And so when the Latin Vulgate translated the Old Testament, it uses the term piety accurately as an accurate translation of our Greek, of our Hebrew term kasid. But since 1653, if you look at a more modern dictionary, you see that the term piety does not mean kind. It means devoted to God or loving God. That's not what piety used to mean. Words change definitions over the time, over periods of time. And I think we can all appreciate the fact that if you've had any exposure to the King James Bible over the years, you can see that a number of English words have changed definition over, over periods of time, sometimes quite significantly. Our word uh, individually in the, in the King James is translated severally. Well, to us, several means many, <laughs> but in the original King James 1611s, severally did not mean many, it meant one individual. And so uh, individually is an accurate translation of, of this term uh, in, the, in, the, in the English when it's used, <clears throat> but over a period of time, uh, that idea of severally has, has changed. And so if you have a King James and you're reading severally, that's gonna convey a different idea to you than what it was would convey to you if you were reading it with an understanding of 1611 King James English, because the term has changed definition. Well, the, the term piety has changed definitions, but our Bibles don't reflect that change of definition. Our Bibles still are based, the translations are still based on that Latin Vulgate translation of piety. Piety now means to be godly or devoted to God, but the term piety originally meant kindness. <clears throat> so when you're looking at the Old Testament, and you're seeing the word godly translated in the Old Testament, it's translated that way because they are basing it on the Latin Vulgate's original meaning of the term piety, not making the distinction that now that term doesn't mean the same thing that it did when the Latin Vulgate was first written. So that, that clears mud to everybody. So now when you see the term 
piety in, in, that's used in the Old Testament, you're going to see many translations translated as godly because that's now what the term piety in, it means in, in, in modern, relatively modern, uh, modern Latin. <clears throat> That further gets confused because <clears throat> within the Latin Vulgate, they take that same term piety and use it to translate the Greek word that is a word that refers to uh, devotion to God. It doesn't mean kindness. The Greek term, <clears throat> um, what is it? Um, sebamai, is it sebamai? Um, you, you sebamai. Exactly, two words. It's you, which is the word good, and sebamai, which means devoted. So the Greek term you uh, sebamai means a good devotion to God. And that's a, <clears throat> may sound a little odd, but it, it's important to recognize that it, it says it's a good devotion because there's a similar term that has a little letter in front of the word that makes, that negates it, which means it's uh, a bad devotion to God. In other words, not devoted for God. And so you have both words in the Greek. You have Sebamai or you sebamai, which is good devotion. You have a sebamai, which is bad or not devoted for God. <clears throat> but the Latin Vulgate translates that devoted for God by the same word piety that they translate the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, kasid. And so when <clears throat> we're reading our New Testament, we we that's translated as godly <clears throat> because of how the term sebamai is used in modern Latin. <clears throat> so. The, the word that we understand as godly in the English really doesn't have an equivalent in the Hebrew and Greek because <clears throat> the term that's translated as godly in both the Old Testament and the New Testament mean two different things. The Old Testament word that's translated godly actually is, is the word for kindness, and the New Testament word that's translated godly is the word for a good devotion for God. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, I, I don't, well, I might have it here. I don't know if I've, no, I think I brought just the ones that, I think the only ones that I have are the places that it's, it's translated as, as, uh, as godly, I believe here. I'd have to look through. Let me get back to you on that, because it's only translated kindness two or three times in the Old Testament. In the New American Standard, I, Should be kindness. Okay, could you show me an example of that? Yeah, we're going to get to several examples of that shortly, like at least maybe half a dozen or a dozen examples. We'll get to that shortly. That, that's the New Testament, though. No, that's in the Old Testament. Okay. Yeah. We haven't really focused on the New Testament too much. We've looked at a couple of instances in the New Testament, but I'm focusing right now on the Old Testament. <clears throat> so we have confusion around this term godly because of how it's misused in the Old Testament based upon the Latin Vulgates. Uh, translation that used to be an accurate translation, but because the term has changed meaning, now when it's used, uh, it, it throws some uh, a monkey wrench into our into our ability to understand it. <clears throat> this understanding of devotion for God. Last week we focused on the fact that this term kindness is used in a very peculiar way that at least at first it seems peculiar. And this is where I got some cross eyes from some of you. And that's the fact that this term is used to describe the one who is the high priest in Israel. And I'm going to go over this again, but I'm also going to go into it further to clarify a little bit more, show a little bit more clearly why not only the fact that God does make that distinction and use that title for the high priest, but I'm going to show you a couple of reasons where I believe why God uses that term to refer to, refer to the high priest. So first of all, if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8, we have a verse, a past section of verses that at first does not seem to have any relationship to our term kindness because it doesn't occur in this immediate context. <clears throat> But bear with me on this, and we'll, we'll go back a little ways and see that, it, that I believe it does. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, I think we're all very well familiar with this passage. That starting in verse 4, it says, The elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you have grown old. Slap in the face. You're too old, Samuel. <laughs> You're an old guy. Your sons do not walk in your ways. 
true statement. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Now, this verb rejected is in the Hebrew, what we call a perfect tense, which refers to a completed action. And while that might not seem significant on the surface, it is when we when we look back at the histories of, uh, of Israel's rejection and that the fact that Israel did not reject God's rule over them. Uh, excuse me, their, their beginning of their rejection of God's rule over them did not begin here with them asking for a king. It actually had its beginnings much earlier than this. And so this perfect tense refers to a, a culmination. In other words, there is a, a period of time where they had been rejected him, and this marked their final absolute rejection of his rule over them. And we can demonstrate that. First of all, I'm just going to allude to this because there's so many verses we could look at. You, you're familiar with them. I don't need to look at specific illustrations. But remember, going back clear to Egypt, when, when God chose Moses to bring them out of the nation, out of, the nation of, of Egypt, how often did Israel obey the Lord's direction? It was this many times, and if you want a really big number, <laughs> it's as big of a zero as you want to write. They never listened or they were never obedient to God's direction. And so they began uh, rejecting God's rule right from the very beginning of their being chosen as a nation and being uh, brought out of the nation of Israel. And that continued through their entire 40 years wandering in the desert. Time after time and time again, they demonstrated and unwillingness to be obedient to the uh, the Lord's rule over them. If you go to Exodus chapter 19, this is another familiar passage, but now this is where we can start seeing a, a relationship here. But first of all, what I want to mention is, is in that context of 1 Samuel, the, the subject of appointing a king over them was very specifically related to one who is to judge them, not just rule them as a king, but one who is specifically one who is to judge them. They said, give us a king who will judge, rule over us and judge us like the other nations have. So judgment played into their, 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 their thinking here. Israel didn't want God to be their judge. They wanted a human uh, vessel to be the one who is commanding them and judging them. So we get to Exodus chapter 19 in verse 4. God says to them, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, God does not use the term kindness here, but he's describing it. God is describing an action that was, that was, indicative or illustrative of the multiple times that God dealt with them kindly. Times when they, they messed up, God judged them, but he did so kindly. He never he didn't let the hammer fall, uh, except in a few rare instances on, on a few groups of people, like you know the, the sons of Korah and Keturah and, and, and those individuals. He had the earth swallow some people up. But as a nation as a whole, he was generally quite gracious in his dealings with them. And he, and he says, you saw this time and time again. You saw how I carried you on eagle's wings. All of you, throughout all of your disobedient times, I carried you. I act, You could paraphrase this by saying, I dealt with you in a graciously, in a kind manner, in spite of all of your disobedience. And he says, now then, verse 5, if you will indeed listen to my voice and guard my covenant. So he's talking about obedience here obedience to one who would was offering to rule over them. He says, if you will, I'm going to paraphrase, if you will obey me, guard my covenants, then you shall be my own possession among all the people for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall, pe shall speak to the sons of Israel. And you remember their, their response down in verse 8. Moses gives that, the answer to the people, and the people says, uh, says all, that the Lord, uh, will, all, all that the Lord will speak to us, we will do. And so rather than, than accepting God's gracious rule, they're asking for 
uh, got for Moses to give them somebody who will give them a set of rules and re regulations to give uh, to obey uh, rather than just being obedient to the voice of the Lord. So God offered to deal with them in kindness and in graciousness, and Israel rejected that. So here you have a major turning, not a turning point, but a, a huge milepost marking Israel's uh, rejection of God's rule over them. And you see this continuing clear up until the days of Samuel. <clears throat> and when Samuel comes along, they're not asking for, <clears throat> for um, somebody who to reign over them in a religious way. See, see, when God gave them, God was offering this rule over them, he said that he would make them a kingdom of priests. So this is talking about, first and foremost, a religious <laughs> rule over them. But we understand that Israel's political rule and religious rule were, were closely tied together because it was the same God that, get, that was reigning over them. Their, their, their commandments that they had to live under was inseparable to their political rule because it was God who was giving them their, their rules and regulations to live by. But in, in, in uh, Exodus 19, you have first and foremost a rejection of God's religious rule. When you get to Samuel, you have Israel's rejection of God's political rule over them. And with their rejection of God's political rule over them, you have this final absolute rejection. First of all, they rejected his overall direction. Then they reject his, his offer of priesthood to them. And then they reject his political rule over them. And that political rejection marked the, the final absolute. From At that point, it marked their final complete a rejection of God's rule. But that rule that God was offering them was a rule that was to be characterized by kindness and was illustrated by multiple acts of kindness to them uh, up to this point. So when God comes to the uh, laying out the, the uh, this rule that's going to be changed now because of their rejection of his rule, he's going to not make them the kingdom of priests at this time that he promised. He will in the future, but at this time, because of their rejection and demanding that God, uh, uh, rejecting of his offer of making them a kingdom of priests, they are rejecting that one who would rule over them in a manner that was illustrated by the manner in which he had ruled over them in the past. In other words, they were rejecting his offer to rule over them in a manner that characterized kindness or graciousness. And they wanted somebody, some human being in God's place. And so God is saying, if you have sin, or not sin, but since you have rejected my offer of, of being a kind rule over you. I'm going to give you a, a ruler that, that demonstrates the ultimate kindness that a human being can, can offer you. So go to Psalm chapter 4. Psalm chapter 4, this is one of the places where this word kindness is used. I believe of God, it's translated godly in, in several translations, but in Psalm chapter 4, Verse 1 says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have re uh, relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? But know that the Lord has set apart the, if you have a New American Standard, this kindly one, or excuse me, godly one, but it's our word for kindness, or kindly one. You have set apart the kind one for yourself. Who is he talking about? Who is the kind one that God is speaking about? Who is the one that God has set apart here? Well, we have to look at this through the Old Testament. We can see who this kind one is that God has set apart to himself. If we go to, uh, First of all, we'll, we'll look at a couple of ways where this, this term is first and foremost used of God himself. In Psalm 145. Lord, if you may hear us from birth, sit dead, the Lord cares for my call to him. Is it referring back to the kind one? It could be, or it could be referring to the priesthood because, uh, it, because this term is used both of God himself and it's used of the priest, either one. It doesn't make it real clear here. 
I, I believe it's talking about the priesthood, but I, but uh, reg- there's a few verses where it is clear who it's referring to. If you go to Psalm 145, this is very clearly talking about God himself as being the one who's kind. In one, Psalm 145, verse 17, it says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. New American Standard translates this word kindness here accurately, this kasid. The Lord is kind in all of his ways. No, no question as, as to which individual is being referred to. It says the Lord is the one who's kind. Uh, Psalm chapter 16, go back the other direction. You could mark Jeremiah 312 down here is another place where this term kasid is used of the Lord. It says the Lord is, uh, well, Lord, it's actually quoting the Lord. The Lord says, I am kind, says the Lord. But in Psalm 16, <clears throat> he uses this term again of the Lord, but in a different way. In Psalm 116, excuse me, Psalm 16, verse, uh, verse 8 this is prophetic, referring to the, the future of the incarnate Son of God. He says, I have set the Lord continually before him because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely uh, or rest in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay or to see corruption, I think King James says. So this is a, refer- a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ in his incarnation. <clears throat> upon his death, there's a promise given to the Lord Jesus Christ that upon his death, while he was waiting those three days and three nights to be resurrected, God the Father promised that he would not see corruption. <clears throat> and this, this is really misunderstood by a lot of people. I have heard this taught so many times <clears throat> by People that are, are knowledgeable and, and science can tell you that uh, upon death, it takes about three days and three nights for decay to set in. And so that's why he was raised after three days so that decay would not have a chance to set in. I will tell you as one who has much experience in this because I have dealt with many, many, many dead bodies as a nurse in the last 30 years of being a nurse. When a person dies, Decay doesn't wait three days and three nights to set in. It begins the second one dies. The very moment of death, decay sets in. And by illustration of this, I don't want to dwell on this and really gross any of you out that might have a problem with thinking about this, but it, the, the best illustration of this that I, I have in my own personal experience, which is not all encompassing, of course, but in Republic, as a nurse up there, we had a person die in the middle of the night. It was in the summertime. <clears throat> and called the mortuary to come pick them up. And he was not going to be able to come for a while, he said. We didn't know what a while meant. So we turned the air conditioner on full bore in that room. So it was plenty cool. The mortician came 14 hours later. And in that 14 hours, in this cool room, it was not hot in this room, even though it was hot outside, air conditioner, full blast, it was cool in there. After 14 hours, you did not want to walk into that room because there was always already a strong odor of decay that was unpleasant. Decay does not wait of, of a human body does not wait three days and three nights. It begins immediately. This promise that the Lord would not see corruption was a supernatural act by God the Father, where that dead body of the Lord Jesus Christ did not begin to decompose even after three days and three nights, when it should have started decaying immediately. But he refers to his the Lord Jesus Christ as his kind one. He doesn't refer to him as his son, as his servant, as his uh, future, his prince. Like he, Many titles are used of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament that look forward to his future relationship with Jesus Christ. But here he uses a term that he's going to use, I believe, of the high priest uh, later on. Or, or not later on, in, in other passages. He says, I will not allow my kind one. This is the one that I have chosen to rule over you. 
in kindness and in graciousness. So even though the Lord's promised that he's going to reign over, over the world with a rod of iron and he's going to do so over the, the nation of Israel, all, he's still going to be demonstrating kindness and graciousness to the nation of Israel during his millennial rule. And he's using this term identifying the, their future ruler that he offered them initially, they rejected, but he still promised that in the future, I'm still going to rule over you by one whose character is marked by kindness or graciousness. But that rule hasn't begun yet because that rule was rejected. So for now, God has given them a different group of individuals that he calls kind ones as well. But they're kind ones that demonstrate the human, uh, the extent of human kindness that is possible to provide. If you go back to, uh, let's see, Deuteronomy chapter 33, we looked at this last week, but Deuteronomy 33 marks the very first time in the Old Testament that this adjec adjectival, uh, see if I pronounce it right, the adjective form of, of kindness occurs, our word kasid, the very first time that it occurs in the Old Testament is in Deuteronomy, which is in that section of, of scripture over a period of time when God is giving Israel the law. It's not used of any human being prior to the giving of the law. It's using to, used to describe a particular individual within the nation of Israel at the beginning of their um, reception of the law. So in Deuteronomy, I'm in Genesis, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse eight, God says, this is Moses speaking. Moses is, is about to die. Uh, he is about to uh, relinquish his role as leader over the nation of Israel. I should say sub-leader because up to this point, God has been their leader. Moses has been the one, uh, the, the one through whom God has been leading the nation. And as soon as uh, Moses finishes this dissertation, Aaron's going to die, and Moses is going to go up in the mountain, he, and he's going to die, and the nation of Israel is going to cross over into the promised land. But just prior to their entry into the promised land, Moses is giving some statements concerning the nation of Israel, and in verse 8, he says, and of Levi, the tribe of Levi, he said, let your Thummim and thy Urim belong to your godly man, New American Standard says, but it's our word, Kassid, to your kind one. Let Urim and Thummim belong to your kind one, whom you did prove at, I'm sorry? Well, I don't know the, the Hebrew, it, it would be C-H-A-S-E-D or something similar in, in, the, in the English pronunciation, it would be with a C-H, uh, Kassid, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't have the Hebrew uh, alphabet and, and mnemonics very, very down very well, like I have the Greek, but it, it's Kassid with a CH. I'm sorry. I honestly don't know if there's a, a, a language similarity between the Hebrew and the, and the Greek, but the definition of, of Kassid is in the Old Testament in the Hebrew is similar to the word Karis in the Greek. The, the meanings are very similar there. And I don't think that they're exact because Caris in the New Testament describes a quality of character that they couldn't demonstrate in the Old Testament because Caris in the New Testament is, is an aspect of God's character that human beings didn't have access to, but they could still demonstrate a degree on a humanistic level of kindness or, or graciousness to other individuals. So <clears throat> there's a similarity, but not quite an identity here. But in Deuteronomy, he says, let your Thummim and your Urim belong to your kind one, whom you did prove at Massah and whom you did contend with at the waters of Meribah. Now, if you, I won't go back there and take the time again to look at this, but you can go back to Numbers chapter 20 and read verses 2 through 13, and we see that this event that occurs here is the event that resulted in Aaron and Moses being prevented from going into the promised land. This is the, the period of time, this event at Massah is when the Israelites were screaming for water and Moses asked the Lord and the Lord says, speak to the rock and I'll let water come out. And then it says, well, in fact, let's do it because it does have important bearing on this. Go to Numbers chapter, I won't read the whole content or the whole section here, but in Numbers chapter 20, 
there's an important thing that occurs here to, to recognize. Numbers chapter 20 in verse eight, God says, take your rod, you and your brother, and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield us water. So God tells them to take the rod, but he doesn't tell them to use the rod. He says, take your rod, but talk to the rock. And last week, we looked at the fact that this rock was actually uh, a manifestation of Jesus Christ. It ha we have that in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, uh, two times in 1 Corinthians 10. This rock that gave them water in the wilderness was actually a, a manifestation, uh, not, a, not a human or a, a living manifestation, but it was a manifestation of the Son of God. And so Moses took the rod from the Lord, just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and said to them, listen now, you rebels. <laughs> Moses is not happy here. He's talking to the nation of Israel. He says, you listen, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice. He says, you want water? I'll give you water. And he beats the son of God <laughs> over the head twice with a stick because numbers tells us that this rock that followed them through the wilderness that gave them spiritual water was a manifestation of the son of God. So Moses in his anger was not just hitting the rock. He was hitting the very person of God himself out of his anger. And most, excuse me, in verse 24, Aaron shall be gathered his people for he shall not enter the land, which I have given the sons of Israel because you rebelled to be against my command at the waters of Meribah. See, this is Moses's rebellion. Moses and Aaron both rebelled at this particular time. And I mentioned last week that this seems to indicate that there is a, a escalation of, of emotion occurring here. Moses talks to the Lord. Lord says, take your rod and speak to the rock, Moses does, but Moses and Aaron both go before the nation of Israel. And so Moses had, had some time to talk to Aaron about this. And Moses is angry and Aaron is angry. And as they talk to each other about what they're supposed to do with the nation of Israel, their emotions get wound higher and higher. And they get themselves worked up into virtually a frenzy till when they get in front of the nation, they are both ticked off. And Moses says, you bunch of rebels, you want water? I'll give you water. Bam, bam, hits the Lord on, on the head twice. And Moses says, or the Lord says, since you and Aaron both disrespected me, neither one of you will be allowed to enter into the nation of Israel. But when we go back to Deuteronomy, he says in chapter 33, this kind one, Deuteronomy 33, verse 8 says of Levi, he said, let your Thummim and your Urim belong to your kind one, singular, whom you tested at Massah, with whom you contended with at the waters of Meribah. There were two individuals that were in contention at this place at this time. One was Aaron and one was Moses. And the Lord Jesus, or the Lord, God says here, let your Urim and Thurim belong to that one who contended. Moses doesn't say that this is referring to him, but this is actually a reference to Aaron. And we can demonstrate that by going to Exodus chapter 28. Leviticus, or Genesis, Exodus chapter 28. This is back where Urim and Thummim are both first mentioned in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 28. Deuteronomy tells us that Urim and Thummim are supposed to be with your kind one. Exodus 28 tells us what that Urim and Thummim represented in chapter 28, verse 30, <clears throat> verse 29. Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastplate of judgment over his heart. That phrase is important, breastplate of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before, before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord constantly. This was in response to Israel refusing to allow God to be judge over them 
And because they've refused to allow God to rule as judge over them, he says, you don't want my kind one? Okay, I will give you one that will show you what man's capacity for kindness is to rule over you. Man will now therefore judge over you. And he gave this Urim and Thummim, and, and we can speculate all day long as to what these two items actually were. We're never giving a, given a description of them, but we are told they, that they somehow were utilized within the high priest's function, office, of judging, at least in some capacities, over the nation of Israel. It was pla they were placed in the, in the breastplate of judgment, and they were used. A, a lot of people say that there was some kind of a mystical thing attached to them, that um, like they were dice that you roll, and, and if they both came up heads, why it was Urim or gave approval. And if they both came up tails, like flipping a coin that they gave. Uh, I, I'm not going to go there. I personally think that they were just symbols that the, that the high priest carried to mark their official capacity to judge over them and that they wore those as a symbol of their authority when they were functioning in the capacity of, of judging over the nation. That's my opinion. I don't think there was any supernatural hocus pocus associated with them. But <clears throat> that aside, they were associated with the high priest's office and in their position of judging. <clears throat> but remember what Deuteronomy 33 said? He says, let your Urim and Thummim be with your kind one who you who contended with at, at the waters of Meribah. And this Urim and Thummim are to be worn by Aaron. Did Aaron and Moses demonstrate kindness to the nation of Israel at the waters of Meribah? They did not. <laughs> they were ticked off at the nation. They were ticked off at God, and they hit God over the head with a rock or with a stick. They uh, chewed out the, the entire nation, and they demonstrated a decidedly unkind man. Now, I'm not saying Israel didn't deserve it, <laughs> but that's not the point. The point was God promised to deal with them kindly, and he had dealt with them kindly through all of their periods of disobedience, without exception. And mankind, and that's because one of the char characteristics of, of God is we're told that he is long-suffering. Is count the long-suffering of God as your salvation because he holds out long. He holds his anger, his wrath, his burning, his judgment long upon those that he, he chooses to do so to accomplish his purpose in demonstrating kindness, grace, long-suffering, burns long before he becomes angry. And he does so far, far, to a far, far greater degree than any human can, can possibly demonstrate. And he showed that mankind has a much shorter fuse than he does. And the individuals that he was going to choose to be their kind one because they rejected God from being their kind judge over them, that the human beings that would judge over them would have a much shorter fuse. And there's going to be, a, there's going to be penalties associated with that short fuse. And so you have this title given to Aaron, the, who is to be the high priest, as he wears the, the Urim and Thummim on the breastplate of judgment, he was now referred to as the kind one because they rejected God from being the kind one. I do think that it's somewhat important that it says whom he proved at Massa when God did instruct him to strike the rock. So it's an example to us that God doesn't always do things in the same way. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. For, in case you, you don't know, remember what she's talking about. There had been instances up this up to this point where God had instructed them to touch the rock with his, his staff. Never told them. I don't think he ever told them to strike the rock, but he told them to touch it. Now, I could be wrong about that. I really don't remember. Well, but in, in Exodus 17, verse 6, in the English, it says, you shall strike, strike the, the rock. rock. Okay. The water will come out of it. Okay. So... Thank you. That, that clarifies that. So they were instructed to strike. But you can see from the language that, that Moses uses in, in um, Numbers that he's doing so out of anger. And the instruction that God, when God told him to strike the rock in this instance that, that you're recording, it wasn't out of anger. It was just in obedience to God's uh, uh, direction to, to strike the rock. So thank you for that. So when we looked at Psalm 4, did we? Did we go to Psalm 4? 
And we'll do, okay, go to Psalm 4 then. Go to Psalm chapter 4. This term, kind one, is mostly used in the, in the book of Psalms. Out of the 32 times it's used in the Old Testament, only five times does it occur outside the book of Psalms. But when you go through the book of Psalms, you can see many times it seems to be a direct relation or a direct reference to some aspect of the priesthood. In Psalm 4, 3, that's, that's Job, that's not going to do it. Psalm 4. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we did read it. Know that the Lord has set apart his kind one for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. The Lord did not hear the prayers of every Tom, Dick, and Harry who called out to him in the Old Testament. He communicated through the priesthood. When someone wanted to pray to God, they did so through the avenue, through the intercession of a priest. So when it says, the Lord hears me when I called him, it had to be through the intermediate agency of a priest in some capacity. And it says that the Lord has set apart for himself the kind one for himself. Who is this kind one? Well, if we go through the book of Psalms, go to chapter 32, Psalm 32. Psalm 32, verse 6. It says, therefore, let everyone who is kind pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in the flood of great waters, uh, they shall not reach him. So again, this is referring to one who is communicating to God, and the only one that could com communicate to God directly, or, or as directly as possible, was actually the high priest. And any communication to God was done through a priest of some kind. But the closest direct communication came through the high priest. Psalm chapter 50. Psalm chapter 50, verse 5. says, gather my godly ones, kind ones, gather my kind ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. You can't get more clear reference to the priesthood in this passage. This kind one is one who has made a covenant with God through the, through means of sacrifice. This is this is talking about someone within the priesthood. He uses the kind one, the word kind one in the singular. He says, "Gather my oh, excuse me, plural, my kind ones." There was more than one high priest in the nation of Israel. There was a, a continual succession of them. We're told that in the book of Hebrews, why there is a succession of them because none of them could continue forever because they had the tendency to die <laughs> as human beings. They couldn't continue on forever. There was only one high priest who was never going to die, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ Himself in His high priestly ministry right now. He can continue forever because He's the only high priest who uh, who is never going to die as he, when he's filling that office. Uh, Psalm 132, verse, uh, verse 16. Her priests also I will clothe with salvation, and her kind ones will sing aloud for joy. So here we have this word kind ones associated with the priesthood, but marked off as distinct from the priesthood. And this is why I think that this is first and foremost a reference to the high priest, because we already saw there was a clear reference to Aaron, and he was the first high priest in the nation of Israel. And so here, here he says, I will cause... Uh, Where's my, my verse? Verse 16. Yeah. Her priest, talking about Israel, her priests I will clothe with salvation. And in addition to her priests, her kind ones uh, will sing aloud for joy. So I think he's referring to the kind ones as being a distinct uh, subgroup from, within the priesthood. Talking about the priesthood as a whole, but within the, the priesthood, there's a select group of individuals that he identifies as kind ones that, again, would be a reference uh, to the high priest. Verse uh, We have it. We, yeah, we have it twice in Psalm 132. We have it in verse nine, and we have it in verse 16. Both a reference to the priesthood and the kindly ones within the nation. Psalm 149. <clears throat> Psalm 149. Verse 
Psalm 149 says in verse, oh, where do you want to go? Verse, go back to verse 6. Psalm 149, verse 6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand, to execute vengeance upon the nations and punishment upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgments written. This is the hour. This is an honor for all his kind ones. Who executed judgments upon the nation of Israel? That one who bore the breastplate of judgment, that was the high priest. The, ju the one who bore the judgments of Israel was the high priest that had the breastplate of judgment with Urim and Thummim uh, contained within them. That marked the high priest as having the authority to be the one who would judge over the nation. Uh, that was Psalm. Psalm. Oh, no, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter, excuse me, Exodus 28, verse 30, said that Urim and Thummim were to be worn in the breastplate of judgment. And actually, you can, if you look up Urim and Thummim, you'll find it's used, I don't know, five or six times in the Old Testament. The, the, we only have two or three references where it's actually used, but it's used in reference to the high priest functioning within a uh, capacity of judgment over the nation. The, the very few times that it's, it's referenced, it's used in relationship of judgment to Israel. And after Nehemiah, I think it's chapter 8, uh, you never see Urim and Thummim men mentioned ever again. And I think that we have a reason for that in Micah. <clears throat> and so let's oh, uh, verse, uh, pro we'll go to Proverbs before we go to Micah, though. Proverbs chapter 2. In Proverbs chapter 2, this occurs once. Oh, that's 22. That's not going to work. Proverbs. Chapter 2, verse 8, it's uh, talking about uh, what, what the Lord does. And he says, verse 7, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, and he preserves the way of his kind ones, not godly ones. He preserves the way of his, of his uh, kind ones. Then you will discern righteousness and judgment and equity and every good course. So Proverbs, again, is using this reference to the kind ones of God in, in relationship to the office of judgment within the nation, one who's exercising judgment within the nation. If we go to chapter 7 of the book of Micah, we have the very last reference to the of, uh, use of this, this adjective. The very first time this word occurs in the Old Testament is in Deuteronomy in <clears throat> relationship to the giving of the law and specifically uh, to the office of high priest. In the book of Micah, you have the very last use of this term in the Old Testament. Not the last book of the Old Testament, but it's the last use of this word in the Old Testament. In Micah chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers and the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig, which I crave. The kind one has perished from the land. There is no upright one among men. I think this verse drives a nail in the coffin of the function of the high priest within the nation of Israel. God demonstrated that Israel rejected God from being a kind rule over them and demanded a human being. And during the course of Israel's history, the kind ones that God appointed to rule in his place as human authorities did so with a marked uh, contrast to the type of kindness that God was capable of showing. And when we get to the book of Micah, we have Micah saying, kind ones have completely disappeared from the land. There is no such thing as a high priest that demonstrates any type of, of, of uh, manifestation of God's kindness. They never did because as human beings, they were incapable of manifesting the type of character that God himself would have ruled the nation of Israel with. And we get to Micah and Micah says, they, they've all together disappeared. I wonder, this is just speculation on my part, if maybe that's why the last uh, reference to the Urim and Thummim we have is clear back in the book of Nehemiah, because for, I'm, perhaps did the, did the high priest quit using it? Was, was it just such a, uh, a ritual that, that 
was so far apart from what their actual character is that the Urim and Thummim had no basis for giving accurate uh, instruction from God for judgment? I don't know. Don't know. God doesn't tell us. But we're told that in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, we don't see Urim and Thummim again, and we get to the book of Micah, and, My and Micah is, what, is wailing. The kind ones completely vanished from the land. There's no such thing as a kind one. The, the priesthood has completely failed at this point. And we know that very shortly hereafter, there occurs 400 years where God does not speak to Israel through the priesthood, and he doesn't even speak to them through the prophets, because there's two, mean, two means by which God spoke to his people in the Old Testament. Primarily was through either the priesthood, the high priest, or through a prophet. And we get to the, the 400 silent years. God has not apparently been speaking to, to, the, to the priesthood for a while. We get to uh, the end of the Old Testament, and God doesn't even speak through a prophet. For 400 years and so the kind one has vanished from the land <laughs> this term kind one is used several times in the book of psalms where there's not a clear reference to whether it's talking about a, a priesthood or not but it is used in such a specific narrow ma manner in the ways where which it is clear that it's a reference to the priesthood or a function of an individual within the priesthood it seems to me that there's a good possibility that the, this time, the times that this term kindness occurs or kind one occurs in the Old Testament is still a reference to the, to the high priest. It, it, it seems to me that that Psalm 43 passage could be a reference to the priesthood and the priesthood would be the priesthood of the Jewish people and that it would be the priesthood of Mm -hmm. Right. The Lord, and the, God, yeah, the, the Lord said to my Lord, the sit to my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool. It's the same thing. That's a possibility. And if that question could be answered through the grammar, it might be. I, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with Hebrew grammar to know if that could be answered within the grammar itself. Maybe those of you that are well, more, more better like versed in it than I am could answer that. But it is clear in other passages that it's a different reference to. Uh, the high priest within the nation. <clears throat> we get to Romans chapter 3. This is important to keep before our eyes. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> He's talking about the relationship that Jew and Gentile has had and does have with God. And in verse Nine, it says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jew and Gentile, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does kindness. Some of your translations, most of them have goodness, but it's a word for kindness. None practice kindness, not even one. <laughs> So when God is talking about his kind ones in the Old Testament, ultimately, he tells us in the New Testament, we could see it through, through the history of Israel. Israel could see it through their own history. But now he makes a clear statement. All those, quote, kind ones, unquote, that God calls kind ones in the Old Testament really weren't because there's not a single kind, not a single human being that is capable of practicing kindness. God is told, we're told that the Lord is kind in the Old Testament. He's capable of practicing kindness. And he was the one as a kind judge who offered his rule over the nation as the one individual in all of creation that was capable of doing so in a manner that demonstrated kindness consistently over and over again, regardless of their failures. And Israel says, nope. We want somebody. We want a person to stand in your place. And God says, okay, I'll put a kind one before you. And that kind one is going to fall on his face over and over and over again, because they will never once be able to demonstrate a shadow even of the type of character that I am capable of, of demonstrating to you as a fallen, twisted, torn up by sin nation. God alone is the one capable of demonstrating genuine kindness consistently to them in spite of all their failures. 
and we see that. So when we get to the New Testament, <clears throat> we have a different word that's used that's translated godly because of the Latin Vulgate's influence taking this eusebia, that means gen or that refers to a good devotion for God, and translating it by piety, the same way it translates this word in the Old Testament, kasid, by the word piety in the Latin Vulgate. In the New Testament, <clears throat> eusebia does not mean kindness. It can include that, but it's a different word. Eusebia in the New Testament that's translated godly and kasid in the Old Testament translated godly, they don't mean the same thing. They don't mean the same thing in, in the Hebrew or the Greek. They're two different words that mean two different things. Kasid in the Greek or in the Hebrew primarily refers to kindness or a kindly one because kasid is a, it's an adjective, the word that we've been looking at. There is a noun form of this word that occurs in the Old Testament. We've just been looking at the adjective form of it. That occurs 32 times. But kasid in the Hebrew is an adjective that refers to a kindly one, one who's demonstrating uh, kindness, describes a kind of person, a kind one. Eusebia in the New Testament is a Greek word that means good, you, sebamai, good devotion. <clears throat> now, it's just interesting. I, I've said this, and, and I'll close with this because we're out of time now that the English equivalent godly does not have its Hebrew or Greek equivalent in scripture. However, there is multiple examples in the New Testament that do indicate uh, a demonstration of God's kind of character with God's people, but he doesn't use the term godly to describe it. When God talks about that aspect of character that's a reflection of his character, he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. He uses a term that does not mean like God. And I'm only throwing this out to think about because I, though, for those of you that were here a couple of weeks ago that heard this, <clears throat> there is a demonstration two times in the Old Testament of one individual who said he wanted to be like God or you can be like God. And I, who's that person? <laughs> Satan, Lucifer, thank you, Lucifer. Lucifer's pride, one of his, his, his greatest I will in Isaiah said, I will be like the most high. And he doesn't use an adjective. He uses just individual Hebrew words that, that indicate, I will be like the most high. And that marked one who is in, uh, who, who brought calamity, ruin upon uh, the entire angelic realm. And then after his fall, he brought that same temptation to Eve. You can be like God, knowing good and evil. Both times that an individual said that they could be or you can be like God or a reference to an attitude or an action that is diametrically opposed to God's character. So even though God does tell us in the New Testament that we can demonstrate a character that is like God, he doesn't use a term like that. And, and I'm just wondering if maybe that's the reason, because he doesn't want us to equate being like God with being the same thing that Satan was promising Eve or that um, he was trying to do himself. Because even though we can demonstrate character that is like God genuinely, because a person of the Godhead produces, in it, uh, produces it in us, we can't demonstrate all the qualities of God. We can't be like God in every way. Uh, Satan was almost or hinting to Eve that that. Uh, she would have an equal standing with God by, by being like God. I can't demonstrate eternal. <laughs> I can't, can't do any way, shape, or form. I, I can't demonstrate uh, the type of power of God. I can demonstrate aspects of God's character that, that, that he, he allows us to, but uh, he doesn't use a term that says like him, but he uses some very similar terms that demonstrate that there is a much greater capacity for us to demonstrate character that harmonizes equally with his by some different words that he used. And we're going to start looking at these next week. He uses a term that, again, misunderstanding that throws shadow over our understanding of what this whole idea of godliness is. We have the word that's in the English, following. But there's a Greek word. There's actually two Greek words that are used that indicate one who is like another, and it's the word uh, mimios. We get our word to mimic from, and we are told to be imitators of God, like dear children. And mimicking, it very <laughs> sounds an awful lot like being like, like God. <clears throat> but we're going to see, 
that uh, the, the, this idea of mimicking is not the, um, the, 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 there's two different ways by which this mimicking can manifest itself. One is a way, a means that demonstrates righteousness. One is a means by which demonstrates unrighteousness, but he uses mimicking and the English translates imitating as being followed, be followers of God. Paul says to be followers of me. He doesn't use the word follow, it's the word to mimic. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll look at that, that next week. So in the New Testament, there is some, some indication of being like God, but he just doesn't use that exact verbiage. He uses different words to describe it. So any questions or comments on this? Or is it all clear as mud? Okay. <clears throat> Father, we, again, we thank you that <clears throat> you give us a capacity to experience and demonstrate kindness. And even though there's not a single human being on the planet that's ever been capable of demonstrating that in and of their own uh, human inabilities, but because we possess your nature within us, uh, your seed resides in us. We are actually born again with, we're members of your household because we actually have a spiritual birth that causes to be, that makes us ones with a direct, a genuine relationship to you as sons. And that gives us the capacity to demonstrate things and, and enabled further by your, your son and by your Holy Spirit, giving us the capacity to demonstrate kindness, to demonstrate qualities that were totally unheard of uh, before this became a reality after the day of Pentecost. But it all comes through a complete uh, submission to you. It doesn't come through some effort on our part, through some uh, super strength or super uh, strong set mentality that allows us to just bull our way through a situation. It comes to a yielded heart that can only be produced by uh, the Holy Spirit as we submit to him in allowing his power to manifest uh, Christ's life through us, eternal life, uh, light to the world. Amen. <clears throat>